Problem! Hi everybody, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And today we talk about death. Death and dying. And mortality, I think. Yeah. It's sort of all of the above. Not, not the metal version of death, but the human version of death. Yeah. But the de- skeleton. Yeah, well, I drew a little Grim Reaper on our notes. Because I, I had to add some form of levity to this because it's about to get heavy. Well, I mean, ish. Ish. We, yeah, we, we, we were hunting around for topics and we're like, we've never talked about dying. Not, like, directly. Yeah. Uh, we should do that. And it was, I don't, convenience is the wrong word. I was supposed to say it was super convenient, but it was also inspired because tonight, as of recording, we recorded our November cover song. Yeah, which is... Uh, Ahead by a Century by the Tragedy Hip. Mm-hmm. And Gordon Downey, of course, died uh, not that long ago, like three three weeks ago, a month ago, not even. Yeah, it's hard to keep track. But, and uh, the original the original idea was was tributes. Um, and then it shifted into, into like, death and mortality. Mm-hmm. The exultations of mortality. Mm-hmm. So, Icebreaker. Mm-hmm. What is one thing that you're on your bucket list? You're like, I, I don't have a bucket list. And then it turns out you have 43 things on your bucket list. Yeah, I, I never called it a, a bucket list. So uh, at first it wasn't something that immediately came to mind. It was it's kind of, it was one of those douchey productivity style goals, checklist style it does things. Sound a little, it does, it, 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 like having heard all 43 of them, it does sound a little bit like that. Yeah, there are a few douchey items in there, but I think there's some that, uh, that I, I, I would stand by without, you know, averting my gaze. Uh, I would say one of the things that's going to be, I'll, I'll just say one of the things that's going to be my white whale is a doctorate. Um, I know it's super, super ambitious, especially because it took me three years to do my master's degree. But um, you know, every once in a while, I just I catch myself thinking, you know, like I, you know, it, w- it would be nice to go back and, and do it. You know the easiest way to cure yourself of that thought is to go and do it and yep. flunk out, <laughs> or just go and t- go and start. Yeah. So that is that's pro. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't say that's the top thing on my bucket list but in in terms of, of the like, context of that list that would probably be one that's up there for me so I am I do not have a bucket list not not for real I have like joke bucket list things I don't really I don't really like the idea of of bucket lists because I find that most of the stuff on them is horse shit because mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I don't I think it's hard to have a bucket list that either that either doesn't wind up being, um, like how to how to massively exploit my privilege, yeah, to to, you know, pursue things in the na- in the name of of my mortality, or, yeah, that sort of like douchey productivity thing. I mean, mm-hmm. not to make fun of your list because yeah. your list is totally legit, mm-hmm. but that idea of like here's a bunch of things you have to do before you die, or you're or you're just like bad at being a human being I don't yeah. think that's what people think of when they think bucket list but well, <laughs> then, but, but that's the douchey productivity version it's like well what what have you done like what uh, yeah. what, are, what do you leave behind yeah that what, is that is the dark side of it and 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 there's definitely that flavor in in and I, I definitely see the influence of that flavor in your list yeah um, in the idea of of sort of you know what one leaves behind etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't, I don't really do bucket lists, Mm -hmm. but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a man, I bleed blood, I, I, my heart beats, have feelings, uh, and I of course have dreams, things that I would like to do, uh, before I, uh, die, I would love to play in an arena. Yeah. Yeah. Even if, even if I opened, doesn't have to be my show. I think I would settle for being the mic check guy. I would love to, <laughs> I would love to play on a stage, and open for an act that I love. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be fucking sweet as hell. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of my, I, I think a lot of my dreams are are. Uh, sort of like either either powerfully personal or like stage focused or like 
channel focused. Like these are these are sort of my my real goals. Mm-hmm. You know, being invited as a guest to cool places. Like basically, it's like I want to have cool people that I, like people that I think are super cool think I'm super cool, and that would make me super happy. <laughs> that's that's bu- my bucket list is just like a long ass list of people that I want to validate me. <laughs> Yeah, no, yours is... Uh... Last last weekend, a streamer that I love quoted my chat line by saying, Player Unknown's hunch fight, and I was like, I felt super validated. I, uh... No, my, like, that's the thing, is my, mine is just as horseshit, like, I, I'm, I'm like, I don't do bucket lists, I don't think they're very cool, but mine's just as horseshit as everybody else's. Uh, that just reminded me of something, uh, it was a, a half-joke, half-serious thing that I said, where... Um, my place in the internet meme culture has been somewhat solidified because I helped to midwife a meme into existence. The Freddie Mercury victory pose from the Rage comics. Mm-hmm. If you go to like the what is it? Uh, know your meme. If you if you read up the the entry on that, my Reddit handle is is listed on there as being one of the people involved in creating that. So I knew I knew as soon as I was validated. Shit. In that meme way, lord I know. in the house. Well, I wouldn't go meme lord. Like I said, I was a midwife. I helped to give birth yeah. to the, the realization of my point idea. is the buckle lists are horseshit, but they're fun yeah. to talk about. They and that's fun. and that's what makes them interesting. Like like it's like bucket lists are like tarot cards. They're mm-hmm. not useful in and of themselves, but they're useful in, in the way that they help you frame your life. Mm-hmm. The, like the your your list of forty three things isn't really a list of forty three things you're gonna do before you die, but it's a list of how you want to approach things. And the kinds of values that you have, mm-hmm. and then those are super useful things to think about. Mm-hmm. Mine are fanatically le- are like phenomenally less organized, as per usual, and mostly relate to myself and how to validate me, <laughs> as per usual. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the lie, Ryan? I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Cut back to our libraries episode, where I'm like, my library is all about me. Yeah. Um. So. Dying and mm-hmm. death and the difference between those, mm-hmm. like death is is is, you know that sort of final ending bit. But I think dying is maybe the focus of today in some in some sense. And w- yeah, and and the, the, like the which is and dying is the, is the the process of mortality. And most of the time, I think when people talk about death they really focus on the dying part of it because it is bound up in the suffering in seeing the end but having having not yet reached it Mm. um in the course that i teach there's a a module section on death um just it talks about a lot of the different aspects of it and it's funny because when in the course the way it's structured the death module comes after the health and disease module, mm. you know, so it kind of becomes a logical progression and death tends to be a little bit more clinical when you come at it in that, in that way. Uh, but the big assignment, the big assignment, um, that the students do for that chapter is one of those eulogy exercises where, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. where they have to write, uh, in this case, it's the obituary one, not the eulogy. So, you know, they have to, you know, talk about, you know, when they died and, you know, give quotes about themselves and, you know, discuss those things that are important to them. What did they achieve? How, what was their family? And so such and so forth. So people tend to think more about the the aspect of dying, reaching the end, but not the, the other side of it. The one that I guess, depending on your belief system, there is nothing after that. Or I would, we don't I, know what's after that. I would that. make an or, argument. Uh, and I would not, this is not my argument. This is um, Emperor of Rome, Marcus Aurelius' argument Mm -hmm. that um, if you like dying is is the bit where you go into nothingness Mm -hmm. if there is a thing after that um, then you haven't really died you're a faker deal (laughs) Marcus Aurelius was a phenomenal stoic (laughs) and was like either there's nothingness in which case I don't care about it Mm -hmm. it, or there's something in which case I'm not really dead Mm -hmm. deal yeah, sunglasses descent. But yeah, and it's worth sort of I think thinking about our, our interactions with with death and dying. Like as you get, I'm I'm 34, and as you get older, people start dying. And I think that that I'm probably in the mid ground for that. Like like I definitely know people who 
Like I, I had a friend lose their mom at a really young age, and like I cannot, I cannot appreciate what that must have been like. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, but it is kind of unusual. Like, like usually you get into your thirties and your forties, and that's when that's when people's parents start kicking the bucket. I actually had that realization. Um first year university where a guy that I, you know, we were friends at school and stuff like that and he he passed in his sleep and I remember that was the realization of I'm at the age now where friends are either going to be marrying off or dying off Mm -hmm. it was like sometimes both sometimes both Uh, before that, you know, like I had a grandmother who passed when I was in my teens um, but it wasn't, I didn't get that realization Mm -hmm. about my mortality until or at least in in that context until first university where it was like wow like you know there was it wasn't an accident and it wasn't a horrible sickness I think he must have had some congenital heart issue and he just it just stopped in his sleep you know mm-hmm. they didn't they didn't say anything much beyond that and yeah so that was that was my one of my first interactions with it on that level yeah I had, I had a, I knew a guy in junior high who killed himself. But it didn't really it didn't really sink in until much later. Um, but I've had a bunch of like like I have I have shepherded over the passing of a bunch of uh, relatives, uh, all of my uncles. Mm-hmm. I think I've talked about that periodically. And to sort of to sort of shift gears, I mean, it's interesting to think about the th- kinds of ways that we leave things behind. So we are our our song for this month. We wanted to do a hip song anyway. We. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had twelve songs, and we're like, we gotta do, a, we gotta do a tragically hip song. Um, but we even we made that decision knowing that Gord Downey was dying. Gord Downey was diagnosed with brain cancer, mm-hmm. and was dying. The, the tragically hip is an institution in Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, they never played in the states, not really. Um, but they have been a like a thirty year long reign over Canadian radio. And that, that will continue, presumably, indefinitely into the future. They are the things that hold the nickel back at bay. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, we like we made that decision. I mean, knowing that, A, we wanted to do one, but also that, that yeah, Gordani was dying. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we, we had a bunch of other songs that we did, and then we finally got to this one. Arguably, I don't, I don't want to say just in time. That's stupid. No. But, like, that, that that does not make me feel good. Um, but I remember they did a concert, their last concert in Kingston, and which is where they're from, and they, they played. It was, it was packed, and it was live-streamed everywhere. It was on every TV, uh, in every bar downtown. It was up on the, the Cube and City Hall. We delayed the start of karaoke at Chainsaw until after the concert was finished. Fuck yeah, you did. And it was a Friday or Saturday. When it was like a happened. Friday. It was like a Friday Saturday night. Yeah. And that that concert was like three four hours long. Yeah. Like it and, and it it preempted everything. It yeah. preempted television programming. Um, it was on the radio. Like the whole thing, the whole country just like stopped. Mm-hmm. It was weird. I saw people downtown just wandering around from, like, television to television in sort of this fugue state. And it's partly because, yeah, like, this is a rad concert. And it was a rad concert by a, by a band that, if you are of a particular age in Canada, like, you have grown up with. Um, they have always been there. Like, they're, 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 they're like an evolved form of Canadian folk dad rock. Mm-hmm. But, like, it would not be a stretch to call Tragically Hip the Leonard Skinner of Canada, mm-hmm. except they have a lot more hit songs than Leonard Skinner. Mm-hmm. But there's also a sense where it's like we're we're watching a dying man say goodbye on stage. We are witnessing like the in in some sense we are witnessing the end of this man's life mm-hmm. as he he pours everything he has into these songs that we grew up with 
Because, like, they played a bunch of stuff from Man Machine Poem, which was their latest album. But most of it was songs that came out 10 years ago, songs that came out 20 years ago, songs that came out 30 years ago. They did, like, three encores. And there's 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 points where, like, you, you can you can see him just crying. You can see him struggling. You can see him... You can hear him screaming into the microphone in this, like, sense of, of powerfully mortal frustration. And it is, it is that... I think that sense in some way that, like, this is a man contesting with the limitations of his body, which is trying which is going to kill him like if he had if he had died on stage it may have been one of the greatest tragedies on television mm -hmm. and, uh, and you did mention in the pre-show that in some sense like with the tragically hip he did like yeah like, like he, the hip, he, he, the he did a bunch of other projects before the end of his life mm -hmm. but he um that was their last concert together that was that was it mm-hmm um, our prime minister was there wearing their shirt, which uh, is power like is powerfully symbolic. I find that amazing. Mm -hmm. um, not not on the like on the sense of the prime minister, who, who I'm not a super huge fan of, but but on the sense of like the hip that they would um, carry such power over the leader of a nation. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of other examples of that that have that have come up. Um, Bowie's album, which is to be released after his death. Yep. Well, I mean, um, the the kind of quip was twenty sixteen was was a big year. Yeah, loss. Yeah. yeah, Bowie, Prince, Lemmy from Motorhead, Lemmy from Motorhead, um, Carrie Fisher. Yeah, I mean, yeah, twenty sixteen. You know, uh, what, what was the line? I don't know if I used it in the podcast. I can't remember, but twenty sixteen was the year all our idols died, and we had to become the people they knew we could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that was how we closed out twenty sixteen's podcast. That is entirely possible. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a year, man. But yeah, I think of that. That there's a play coming to uh, a local theater uh, in next year in their next in, like in their next year season called "She Fights Monsters," and it's all about a girl who commits suicide. And the the play is not about that. The play is about the fact that she she played D and D and she left behind an adventure. That was that was labeled in the event of my death, and they are playing this adventure. This adventure she wrote, knowing that she would die, and it's that kind of of shouting in the dark that I, I find very compelling. Mm -hmm. Find the I, I mean the whole notion of the internet is is. Like Twitter is a large process of shouting into the dark and hoping that people will hear you. And is that struggle, I think, to to be heard after we succumb to the frailty of our bodies. Mm -hmm. To to leave this thing behind. And whether this thing is an endowment for forty thousand dollars to our alma mater or university mm -hmm. or whether this thing is an album it is a you know a book, a piece of writing, a poem, a set of journals. Yeah, like whatever whatever that happens to be. Like we we and I and there is I think a there is a temptation to find that meaningless, like that sort of struggle in the face of inevitability. Um, but I find it to be precisely the opposite. I think that we as humans have always been shouting in the dark, and we have become progressively better shouters. Vo the Voyager probe mm -hmm. is perhaps our best shout ever. We have shouted so loudly that even after the sun expands and consumes the Earth in four and a half billion years, there will be this little tiny space probe, like, you know, not even halfway to the next galaxy that will contain the memories of humankind. Mm -hmm. That's loud. That's rad. 
At least until it comes back searching for the creator. <laughs> we don't talk about V'ger. <laughs> we don't talk about Star Trek 1. We don't talk about... No. No, get off my podcast. <laughs> but, like, podcasts are, are in themselves. Like, they're, they're a method of, of, of shouting in the dark, certainly. Mm. They're a method of, of, of telling people we are here. Graffiti. Um, no, I mean, not not so much in the face of, of mortality in the, as in the face of gentrification, but like graffiti again is is a, is a a mark that that I am here. I've been uh, musing about this off and on for the last couple of years. Well, basically since I got Twitter, thinking about Twitter and Facebook as as you know records of well, especially specifically Twitter and how I use Twitter. I use it more mm-hmm. one directionally shouting into the void uh, rather yeah. than interacting in the void and it's uh, you know wh- the kind of responsibilities that I f- wonder if I should be taking you know should I be curating it what kind of mm-hmm. what kind of conclusions can you draw digital about- historians will tell you that Facebook is the largest human historical project ever in history mm-hmm. like autobiographical history it's just there on Facebook mm-hmm um, and like the way the the way that you use it for you is as important mm-hmm. as anything. So I'm curious what the next next iterations of the biographies are going to be when you start going through because normally biographies you comb through people's correspondence and letters and stuff. And, you know, if you had per, per, now you just yeah you, know, you just download somebody's Instagram. Yeah, but I'm talking about before you might have you know a couple thousand letters if they're a prolific letter writer that may have survived. But now, like, I don't delete a lot of my emails. I, I never delete emails. Yeah, so I mean, when you have these archives and, and accounts, you know, of emails and mm-hmm. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, vlogs, I well, accounted, think, what, think, what I have. Think about it this way: How many things do you buy off of Amazon? Oh. It's, they can it's, re- been, exce- it's a, been accelerating. A person can reconstruct everything that you like about your life. I mean, that's and that's super rad. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I do not like. Like, I understand that there's a there's a method of objecting to that, but I I don't. Um. Again, these are all methods of persistence. Some more effective than others. Mm-hmm. Some, uh, more endearing than others. But, I mean. At the end of the day, what remains is that dark, that encroaching darkness. And we are, all of us, shouting. In the event of my death, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's sort of the next step is... And we... we, So we wrote this down in our show notes, but we didn't actually talk about it. No, I made one joke... We just assumed that we would know yeah. when this came, what, what to talk about. But but yeah, I think that, that largely, what is what would you want done in the event of your death? Yeah. Like, what is your thing? I Ever since I heard about She Fights Monsters, I've joked that I'm going to make an adventure and just, like, leave it somewhere, like, with a notary and mail it out to people in the event of my death. Mm-hmm. But I'm not actually going to do that. Yeah, I mean the the standard answer in the event of my death is clear my browsing history. <laughs> um, I've already started thinking about this. Strangely enough, when mm-hmm. I when I finally got full time work, HR forced me to sit down and look at my benefits package, which included uh, pay, lump sum payouts in the event of my death. Yep, and making decisions in terms of you know the basic coverage is is that good enough? And I actually elected to have. It pay for more coverage, um, sp- specifically because I'm like, okay, so you know, a funeral is going to be expensive, but if I die suddenly, those student loans got to go somewhere. So I actually opted for additional additional money so that at the very least I can discharge my debts in death, so that nobody else has to has to handle that. I mean, mm-hmm. housing. You know, if you know Sarah and I move and we take on a, a mortgage together in our, in our names, that's a different thing. But my student debts, because of, especially because um, my parents co-signed my loans, and so I knew yeah. that they would be responsible if I went before they did. Um, and so, yeah, two two years ago, I think when I when I was signing off on these things, it was the first time that I started to think, okay, what do I want to happen when I die? Um, I haven't gotten very far beyond that. You know, like, is there a letter that I send to a lawyer to hold on to? I have, I've, I haven't done my will. 
you know, I haven't done any kind of advanced directives, and which is funny. I took a, a psychology of death and dying course in university, in undergrad, and the one of the few take-home messages that still is burned in my head is uh, when it comes to dying, it is always best to think far ahead rather than putting off these questions because it makes the process of dying it allow it allows you the freedom often to to try to enjoy yourself in the dying process rather than having to worry about squaring these things up and how do I take care of debts and whatnot. So things mm-hmm. like spelling out your will early stops you from needing to worry about it later on. You can always update it, but you should think about these things ahead of time when you have a you know clear conscious mind. Um, so yeah, that's so yeah, it's uh, so I'm the complete opposite. Um, the uh, the neat thing about not uh, about like spending a bunch of your twenties not thinking you're going to make it to thirty is anything you do that remotely like looks like preparing for your demise is immediately suspect Mm -hmm. it is immediately one step closer to a very permanent mistake Mm -hmm. um i've talked about stuff uh, in other videos about like my mac and cheese and whatnot and it's like it's one of those things where the the compulsion and, and and not just the compulsion but the the like the professional advice surrounding that kind of thing um is when you when you see yourself starting to get these things in order that is when you need to start being more vigilant um like when you when you when you see yourself forming plans or um disrupting relationships mm-hmm. um like in and employment and things like that when you see yourself backing yourself into a corner um those are those are occasions on which to be dramatically more vigilant and so so any thought of that kind of thing uh like I, I, during that sort of midpoint of my life was to be immediately banished mm-hmm and I mean, it helps that you don't have very much to like give away. You're like, oh, um, my friends are gonna claim a bunch of my stuff, and you know my surviving relatives will give it to them because they don't want it, and uh, you know my relatives can have whatever money I have, mm-hmm. which isn't very much. <laughs> so cool. I don't really have a super need for a will. You know, it's pretty. It's pretty obvious who in my life gets what. Where are your books gonna go? I thought about that. Where where I'd want my books to go. Hmm. I hadn't thought about that one. They probably just sit in my house until. Yeah. I'd say I like at one point I said I wanted them with me. I wanted to donate them to a library, but I can't think of a library off the top of my head that would actually benefit from them. Yeah. As opposed to. Well, I've seen your library. I don't blame them. Oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just. Kidding. I was alright. That was that wasn't called for. I do have a lot of douchey self help books. But yeah, like there there is there there's all the all the practical stuff, I think. But then there's also the idea of in in the event of my death, like what do what do I want people to do? You know, there's the the, the who cries at your funeral thing. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's that that bit. I, I'm I'm not super attracted to the idea of having a funeral. I don't really I, care. I yeah, I'm I'm kind of in the same boat. I haven't really concerned myself with who's going to cry at my funeral. What tends to concern me or at least occupy my thinking more is what do I leave behind? Mm-hmm. And I mean, some of that was the motivation for the cover song challenge when I proposed it. Some of that was bound up in the doodle challenge. We're going to play one of those cover songs. At your funeral. I'm, I'm going to be 75. May, probably 85. And uh, we're going to play one. And they're going to be like, is there a song you'd like to play for Huck? And I'm going to look at Sarah and be like, I understand Huck's wishes on this. And I'll just pick one at random. It'll probably be the December cover song. Mm. And uh, I was going to go with the with the Katy Perry one. 
Oh, yeah. You know what? That was a good one. <laughs> that was a good quality cover. Uh, but, yeah, uh, and the podcast was kind of born out of that idea. And that's, like, I vlog, and I, I think about that sometimes. Who am I? I always address my vlogs to my future self, but always in the back of my mind, I, I'm curious, you know, is it my future self, and then in the event of my death, delete my account? Or would I want people to see it? Because there are some personal things that I talk about in there when I work th- when I'm trying to working work my way through issues, you know. Yeah. And so you know who who is the ultimate recipient? Is it Marcus Aurelius's idea that he's writing it to himself and it's you know supposed to be destroyed? I don't know, but those those are the things you know. Uh, I think I've quoted it before on the podcast. The kind of Greek proverb, you know, society grows great when. You know, men plant trees under whose shade they won't sit, and yep. some, and sometimes I think about that. What is it? What is it that's gonna be left behind when I die? What is it that is going to outlive me when you know? And and this is something that I I talk, uh, well I, I talk about it, but with my students and stuff, the the idea that you know any monument that you create in time will be destroyed. Mm-hmm. You know that kind of taking that um, line of reasoning to the ultimate extreme in terms of, you know, nothing you do really matters if, if the time scale is large enough, you know, uh, within, what do they say, for most people within two generations, the memory of them is gone. Mm-hmm. You know, very few people are actually committed to the history books. So, you know, I want that, that, that reference of on your uh, tombstone, you have your birthday, you have your death date, and then the hyphen is what matters. What do you do with that hyphen? So I, I don't have a good answer for that. I tend to, you know, reflect on it, think about it. I don't have a good answer for it for myself yet. So we wanted to close this off with the idea of um, stupid things people say about using dying to live. Like the, 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 the notion, you, it, was, uh, it was the author you quoted. Which one? Uh, the one who said that living every day like it's in your last is really is oh yeah it, it was an article by Ryan Holiday yeah. he, uh, that I read today where yeah where he says the advice of living every day as if it was your last is stupid because it never takes planning or long yeah, like, well, account why would I why would I pay my bills why would I spend why would I spend not spend all my money why would I why would I save money unless yeah. I thought that I was actually going to to live longer. Um, like if I, if I wasn't being disingenuous about that, and to be fair, like, like it's not meant to be taken literally. It's meant to, to just be like a a thing that you say that's helpful to, and helps you think about situations and stuff. Um, and holidays extraction from that was, was live every day. Like you're going to be deployed tomorrow. Yeah. That idea of like focus on the important things and wrap up the important business. Yeah. And I I'm not a fan of that either because mm-hmm. again I think that I think that the notion of of using like dying or deployment in that way seems weird to me mm-hmm. because again there's lots of things that you just don't care about like I I I like my job my job's rad um but if I had to pick the top five things that are most important to me in my life, my job would not make the cut. Yeah. If I was like, I'm going to spend all my time on the top five things that are that are most important to me, I would not have a job. <laughs> Certainly wouldn't be my actual day job, which I do like. But part of the reason why I like it is because it pays my bills. Mm-hmm. Like, I got to make rent. I got to make groceries. Yeah, that was the joke. Facts the, of life, man. That was the joke in the pre-show. Is that the job is a thing you do because you know you're not gonna die tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I like. I'm. I. I I'm not gonna die tomorrow. I gotta go to work. Yeah. And and it's and it's and it's hilarious because there are there are definitely like like depending on who you are, depending on the situ the situation you're in. Sometimes that's you. That's all you got. You're like, I can't. I can't die tomorrow. I gotta go to work, and people at work are expecting me to show up and do things. All right, let's do it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's that idea of, of we can't like we we can't quit, but it isn't but it isn't important. Is it, it, it? It doesn't rank. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it seems weird to me. I think that the better way to 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 
think about, or at least a better way to think about, it, is the reminder that you are mortal. That one day you will die. And that it is important to remember that mortality. And, and I think in the pre-show I said something about to remind yourself that moments are precious. But I think that's just a re a restructuring of, of what they're saying with live every day like it's your last. But uh, I, I think a better way to focus that is to allow your mortality to remind you that it is in every moment important not to be careless. Mm-hmm. To be careless with relationships, to be careless with possessions. Um, if, if every moment is to be precious that does not mean that we need to spend it on you know the things that matter most to us we can recognize the the prevalence of of things that take us from moment to moment but let us at the very least act with care and diligence so that if that moment is our last, we we acquit ourselves well. Mm-hmm. You know, let us let us lay in our deathbeds, and if we cannot acknowledge a life well lived, wherein we accomplished all of the things on our bucket list, and and pushed everything to the limit then let us at least acknowledge a life well spent with every moment traded for care and mindfulness in the people and the situations around us and the responsibilities we have to them I feel like I should have gone first because I (laughs) (laughs) sorry man I don't feel I don't feel like I'm going to be nearly so profound uh, Sorry. What the only thing I thought of in the pre-show was a, a weird living with this weird paradox that perhaps resolving it is not the most important thing, but instead to grapple with the paradox is simultaneously living as if you matter and everything that you do matters. In the not in the sense that you know you are important, but that the things you do have consequences to other people or. You know, to your mm-hmm. environment, that there's a certain responsibility that comes with it, while also simultaneously realizing that nothing really matters, and trying to strike a balance with those two, those two extremes. You know, not basically. I guess you cash it out in terms of don't sweat the small stuff and and make sure you take care of the important stuff. Mm-hmm. That might be the way of resolving the two or squaring the two, but um, yeah, I, I feel like. You know how I live is trying to balance between reminding myself that what I do is important and also not important. And then, if that's the way I live, then I guess that's the way I die. I don't know. Like I said, I probably should have went first because what you said was much more profound. And I am uh, I am a crappy after mint for the, for the dinner that we just had. That's that's not true. The crappy after mint is the bit where we plug all our social media stuff. <laughs> oh, yes. So, yeah, you can find us down below. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on iTunes and rate and subscribe to us there. You can find us on... Patreon. Patreon. We have a Patreon now, so you can back us uh, for this and the streams and for other projects because we're streaming on Twitch every Thursday and Sunday. And... Last but not least, we only have, after today, three podcasts left, three episodes, and then we're going to go on and do the next thing. And what is the next thing? Well, it's a surprise right now, but it's going to be rad. Mm -hmm. This is not the death of the podcast. This is its transition into something else. If it dies, we don't concern ourselves, and if it turns into something else, then it's not really dying. That's exactly it. That's exactly (laughs) it. I guess if anything from this podcast... Or this episode, we can we can kind of think about it in this way in terms of if you want to remind yourself of being mortal and not to spend your time frivolously, then I guess Oh no, know. fuck that. Spend your time frivolously. Like frivolity is important. No, what I mean is is we tend to spend a lot of our times forgetting that life is slipping away from us. 
you know, we get too serious or we, we bog ourselves down in the minutia and the, in the day-to-day stuff with, without remembering. I do to say, do it. time keeps on slipping, 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 slipping into the future. And therefore, my solution to that is, well, stay awesome. Stay awesome. Let's get this fucking show on the road. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I know. I know. That's how we start.